With an understanding of how sampling works, we can look at using discrete time filters to implement effectively continuous time filters. So as shown in this block diagram here, we have some continuous time signal x, c of t that we desire to filter. So what we're going to do is sample that signal at intervals of n times t, and then we're going to apply a discrete time filter, frequency response g of e to the j omega, and apply that to the sampled signal x of n, That'll produce an output y of n, which will then apply to a digital to analog converter, which reconstructs an analog signal. And we're going to assume for this analysis that this is ideal reconstruction, which we've talked about in a previous lecture. So then finally we get the output y c of t. And this is equivalent, or at least we're going to look at the equivalence, of this process to some continuous time filtering action h of omega. So let's suppose that I have some desired filter action h of omega. Maybe it's a band pass filtering or a high pass filter. And my question is, how do I translate my specifications on h of omega to specifications on the discrete time filter g of e to the j omega? That's Inter between the analog to digital conversion and then the digital to analog conversion. Let's take a simple example and suppose I have speech and what I'd like to do is remove low frequency noise. And we'll assume that refers to frequencies less than 100 Hertz. So what I want to do now is generate a high pass filter that passes signals above a 100 hertz. And the question is how we do this. For this particular example, which we'll come back to after we analyze this problem, we're going to assume that the input signal, the speech signal, has been band limited to 4 kilohertz, which would correspond to 8,000 pi radians per second, and that if the sampling frequency, omega sub s, is equal to 20,000 pi, radians per second, which corresponds to a sampling frequency in hertz of 10,000 hertz or 10 kilohertz. So we're going to satisfy the sampling theorem because the bandwidth of the signal is 4 kilohertz and we're sampling at 10 kilohertz. So we'll look at this example a little bit later on, but the question is with these parameters, how would I choose my discrete time filter g of e to the j omega so that I implement a high-pass filtering characteristic where I get rid of all the, the energy below 100 hertz, which I'm assuming to be noise here. So to analyze this problem, first we're going to write down a few facts. One is that the Fourier transform of xc of t is xc of omega. We'll denote the Fourier transform of the continuous time output yc of t as yc of omega. And similarly, the discrete time signals x of n and y of n will have discrete time Fourier transforms x of e to the j omega and y of e to the j omega. Some facts that we've looked at in the past, which will be needed here, is that discrete time frequency lowercase omega is equal to continuous time frequency capital omega times the sampling interval t, and that the ideal reconstruction process involves multiplying the signal by an analog low-pass filter which has gained t in the passband, and the passband stretches from minus omega s over 2 to omega s over 2. So from our block diagram, we can see that the output, yc of omega, is going to be ideal reconstruction, which we'll write as hlp of omega, times y of e to the j omega, where that's lowercase omega, but to make these compatible, I need to use the fact that lowercase omega is equal to uppercase omega times t. In other words, the output for a transform is HLP of omega times y of e to the j uppercase omega times t. Now, try, we're going to work backwards here, so we're going to understand what y of e to the j omega t is. And we have, of course, that y of e to the j omega, lowercase omega, is just the product of the discrete time filter frequency response times the discrete time Fourier transform of the input signal x of e to the j omega. 
So putting things together here in, into this expression that we have for yc of omega, we finally conclude that yc of omega is equal to hlp of capital omega times g of e to the j capital omega t times x of e to the j capital omega t. So we've worked our way back through to the discrete time Fourier transform involving the input x of n, and now we need to take the sampling in operation into account. So recall that if I sample a signal, I can express the Fourier transform of the sample signal, which we've used a subscript s for. So I've got x sub c sub s of omega is just 1 over t times the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity, of xc of omega minus k omega s. So we're taking the Fourier transform of the original continuous time signal and we're shifting it by omega s, multiples of omega s, and adding those up. So again, using the relationship between discrete time frequency lowercase omega and continuous time frequency capital omega, we know that the discrete time Fourier transform x of e to the j lowercase omega is just this continuous time Fourier transform with the substitution uppercase omega is equal to lowercase omega times t. And I can write this out just by replacing uppercase omega in the original expression by lowercase omega divided by t. And so, of course, this also implies that x of e to the j uppercase omega times t is just 1 over t, sum k equals minus infinity to infinity, x c of omega minus k omega s. So everything checks out. We're basically getting what we would expect. And we then have that, finally, that can express the Fourier transform of the output of this operation, y c of omega, in terms of the Fourier transform of the input and the various system operations. So the reconstruction operation, ideal reconstruction, is equivalent to low-pass filtering with HLP. And we have our discrete time system, which is equivalent to operating with a continuous time frequency response, G of E to the J uppercase omega times T. And then the sampling operation, which gives us 1 over T, sum K equals minus infinity to infinity, of x c of omega minus k omega s. So this expression tells us how the output spectrum relates to the input spectrum as a function of the system parameter. Now to analyze this further, we need to, uh, we're gonna assume that the Fourier transform of the input signal is zero for frequencies greater than half the sampling frequency. In other words, we're assuming that the input signal satisfies the sampling theorem. And using the fact that the reconstruction filter is zero for frequencies greater than half the sampling frequency, when we multiply these two things, we actually, and the, the t, the gain of t in the low-pass filter cancels the 1 over t in the sampling operation, this is going to give us x c of omega, the product of these two terms. And this basically is saying that, according to the sampling theorem, we can sample the signal and perfectly reconstruct the original signal from those samples if we satisfy these sampling theorem conditions. Graphically, we can see this by mm -hmm. sketching the various terms. So here we've shown the Fourier transform of the sampled signal, where we've taken x of e to j omega and replaced lowercase omega by capital omega times t. And this is, of course, assuming that the original continuous time signal had Fourier transform given by this triangle. So we have 1 over t, and then we have the replicates at multiples of the sampling frequency omega sub s. And so in this system, we're going to have the reconstruction filter, HLP, applied to this sample signal. And we're saying that because there's no aliasing and we have ideal reconstruction, we're going to get back the Fourier transform that we started with before we sampled the signal. So this product in the expression for the output of this equivalent filter should reduce to xc of omega. And we can see that by multiplying by the reconstruction filter. The t here cancels the 1 over t and the low pass action eliminates the replicates, and consequently we get the Fourier transform of the original signal, xc of omega. 
So finally, under the conditions that the sampling theorem is satisfied and we have the ideal reconstruction, we see that the spectrum of the output yc of omega is just equal to the frequency response of the filter evaluated at uppercase omega times t times Fourier transform of the input signal. And this relationship holds provided that we're looking at frequencies which are less than one half the sampling frequency. So the specifications on our continuous time filter that we're seeking to implement using this discrete time approach transferred directly to the discrete time filter provided the frequencies are less than half the sampling frequency. So let's get back to our speech example. Recall that we had a sampling frequency f sub s of 10 to the fourth hertz, which is 10 kilohertz. So that implies that t is equal to 10 to the minus 4 seconds. And of course, as we had written down originally, omega s was equal to 20 pi kiloradians per second. So let's suppose that the speech signal we're interested in has a spectrum something like this. Remember we said it was band limited to 4 kilohertz. Convenience will make this 1. If I have 4 kilohertz, then this is 4 kilohertz translates to 8 pi kilohertz or kiloradians per second. So this will be units here of kiloradians per second. And using the fact that omega is equal to lowercase omega is equal to capital case omega times t, which in this case is 10 to the minus 4, we can sketch out the discrete time Fourier transform of the sample signal x of n, call that x of e to j omega. So the upper band limit of the discrete time Fourier transform of the sample signal ends up being 0 0.8 pi radians, because we're going to take the 8 pi kiloradians per second, multiply that by 10 to the minus 4th seconds, and that gives us 0.8 pi. Now recall that our goal was to high pass filter with what cut off 100 hertz. Of course that corresponds in radian frequency to 200 pi radians per second. So if we sketch our filter, remember that the, this would be our h of omega is just a high pass filter with cut off 200 pi. We said that h of omega translates directly to g of e to the j capital omega times t. So g of e to the j capital omega times t. And remember, we're only going to go up to omega s over 2 here because above that, we're violating the sampling theorem. So what g of e to the j omega t has to look like in this interval, and remember, omega s is 20 pi kiloradians per second. So this is going to be 10 pi kiloradians per second. So g has to look like this. So the cutoff here is going to be 200 pi, which is 0.2 pi in units of kiloradians per second. And of course, we have minus 0.2 pi on the other side. So if we translate this to units of radians, or lowercase omega, what g of e to j omega is going to look like. So I've drawn g of e to j omega here, and I've converted using the relationship that omega is equal to capital omega times t. And so I've got uh, 200 pi times 10 to the minus fourth gives me 0 0.02 pi for the cutoff frequency of this high pass filter. Now I've also explicitly shown the fact that g of e to the j omega as a discrete time Fourier transform is always 2 pi periodic. So that means that, of course, g of e to the j capital omega t has to be have period 2 pi over t, which is just omega s. So I didn't show that when I wrote g of e to the j omega t up here didn't show over a broad enough range of omega, but uh, it is 2 pi over t periodic. So what we've shown now is that if we have a sampling operation and we satisfy the conditions of the sampling theorem and ideal reconstruction, that we can use a discrete time filter to implement a continuous time filter function. And we've now understand how to translate 
the requirements on that continuous time filter to the specifications on the discrete time filter.